Hey, Tommy, do you remember like three years ago when we took the uh, Tesla Model X off-road? Do you remember what happened? I do, yeah. We took a electric Tesla into the rocks and the dirt, and it used a lot of electricity in a pretty short amount of time. Well, in this episode of TFL Talk, we're going to talk about what it's like to off-road in pure electric mode because we recently had a chance to take the new Wrangler 4xe uh, off-road in all-electric, and it was quite well, eye-opening would be a good word, and uh, shocking would be another good word as to how much range we got. We're also going to be talking about the fact that I got to drive, dude, the new Hyundai Santa Cruz. You know what that is? It's the new little Hyundai pickup truck thing. Yeah, is it a truck? Is it a car? Is it a ute? Is it a trucklet? Is All it, the above. Is it, you know, the next incarnation of the Subaru Baja? And I also got to drive, get this, the new Hyundai Kona N, which is the new hot hatch uh, from Hyundai that's coming at the end of this year. So all that is coming up in this episode of TFL Talk. Uh, so shall we hit it? And uh, before we do, though, Tommy, we should thank our Patreon patrons uh, because they make this possible. Big thank you to everybody out there who support the channel directly through Patreon. It could not be possible without you. So I uh, just want to give those fine men and women a shout out for making this channel happen. So big thank you to those guys. Yeah, and if you want to help support the team, uh, go to uh, uh, Patreon slash uh, TFL car, patreon.com slash TFL car, uh, and support us in any way you can and keep this podcast commercial free because like many podcasts, uh, are already you know, jumping on the advertising bandwagon, you can listen to us without any interruptions from sponsors. So uh, let's get right to it. So um, want to define what a 4xe is? Well, it's a Wrangler, so it's an open-top convertible Jeep. It only comes in the four-door configuration, but what makes it special is it uses a combination of gasoline and electric powertrain. So up front is a two-liter turbocharged gasoline engine, mated to an eight-speed automatic, but in between the engine and the transmission is a large electric motor. Now, on electricity alone, the 4xe will go an EPA-estimated 21 miles before the gasoline engine kicks on, and this is a key part, right? Charge it up, go 21 miles on electricity, and then when that dies, you run it like a gasoline Jeep. So it's not like it's completely dead like an electric car. You can still run it on a good old dino juice. Yeah, and uh, if you're not familiar with that 4xe moniker, um Better get used to it because Jeep is electrifying everything, right? So there's a Grand Cherokee 4 e coming uh, very soon. Uh, and, uh, yeah, what's the battery size on it? I think it's 17.3 kilowatt hours. And to put that in perspective, the early lease were 24 kilowatt hours. A Tesla Model X is like 100 kilowatt hours. So 17.3 is small for a full electric car, but that's actually a pretty sizable pack for a plug-in hybrid. Typically, um, especially the early incarnations, like 7 to 13 were pretty typical. So 17 is pretty chunky. Yeah, now Nathan got to take it on our loop, on our EV loop. And how far did he go in all electric mode? On the road, yeah. a mix of highway and city driving, he went a whopping 27 miles. And that wasn't even hypermiling. That was with the climate control on and driving it fairly normally. So he was actually able to beat the EPA estimated range on electricity alone. Yeah, that's pretty amazing, right? Uh, because let's face it, the uh, Wrangler isn't exactly the most aerodynamic, fuel efficient, no rolling resistant vehicle because it's rolling on, uh, uh, I want to say, what does it come from the factory? What are those KO2s now? They keep changing. Well, you can get the 4xE in two trims. Yeah. So you can get it in a street oriented trim, or you can also get it in the Rubicon. And the Rubicon has the locking differentials, the sway bar disconnect, the off-road tires. The one we had was a Rubicon on 33 inch tall tires. And the cool thing about the 4xE, it's a real Jeep, right? So, so many of the plug-in hybrids that have been on the market or are currently on the market in the SUV space have been primarily road going, like the um, Toyota RAV4 Prime, great vehicle, but not an off-road vehicle. The Wrangler is specifically designed to have the same capability in the hybrid version as the gasoline or diesel model. So it's got the locking discs, the sway bar disconnect, the skid plates, everything you need to hit the trails. It just happens to also have an electric mode. Yeah, for those of you who watched our video, which uh, uh, was published this weekend, you'll know the answer to this. But uh, the question that I'm going to pose, and uh, let us know in the comments below before we answer it, how far do you think we got in all electric mode in the 4 by e off-roading? Now, keep in mind that it does have this little button called e-save, right? So it lets you basically drive 
of the vehicle using the gasoline engine to the trailhead so you can save the battery for off-roading. Uh, but when you do that, you don't get 100% of the battery, you get like 95%, right? Yes, and then there's also hybrid mode, which will basically the car determines whether or not you want to run on electricity or gasoline. So in hybrid mode, for example, if you have a full charge battery, it'll start you out in electricity, but then maybe if you hit the highway, the computer will realize, well, this is not a very efficient time to be running on electricity. Maybe we click over to gasoline and then back to electricity. And then there's full electric mode, which will lock out the gas engine as long as possible, as long as you have charge in the pack, which is pretty cool. Now, if you do want to know how far we went, we did spoil it already. Yep in our Bronco versus Wrangler versus Defender video. So some of you already know, but needless to say, it wasn't very far. But the cool thing about the 4xE is, I've been seeing a ton of them, really a lot of these Wrangler 4xE. So if we go ahead and go to the Jeep configurator and build one out, let's take a look at some of the pricing here. So the Zahara starts at 51, the Rubicon starts at 54, and the high altitude, which is the luxury model, starts at close to $57,000. But where it gets interesting is because it's got a large battery pack, it does apply for the federal tax credit. So if your tax liability federally is over, say, $7,500, you'll get $7,500 back on your taxes. So to put that in perspective, that would make that... Um, just a little bit more expensive with the tax credit than the base Rubicon. Can I, can I cut to the chase? What? It's the cheapest Rubicon you can buy. Well, not not technically. If you qualify. Not really technically either, though, because the Rubicon starts at 43. Yeah, but that doesn't exist. Yeah. So it's the cheapest Rubicon you can buy because you can get here in Colorado 10K back. Uh, and uh, even if you lease it, that also comes off your lease in a weird way. It's very complicated. We won't go into it, but that can also be applied to a lease. So people are buying them or were buying them while they were still available uh, at the dealership. We just drove by the Jeep dealership and I think they had like uh, uh, a couple of cats and dogs they were selling. <laughs> They're not, 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 not giving up on selling Jeeps. Seriously, I think there were like uh, three gladiators and a couple of the new uh, uh, Grand uh, uh, Cherokee L's for sale. That's it. I mean, it's it's really uh, sparse pickings out there right now because of the chip shortage. Uh, but yeah, they were they were the most popular, I think, Rubicons, just because even if you didn't take it off-road, it was still a bargain in the Rubicon world. I think that the way to do it would not be to buy one. I think that's not a great idea. I would just go ahead and lease well, one because the lease deals are really cheap. That's yeah. where you get into the cheapest Rubicon. Well, all the EV people are uh, getting their uh, uh, undies in a bundle because apparently non-EV people are buying these and you can potentially get one of these, right, and never plug it in. Sure. And just take the tax credit. And the problem with that, this is where the EV people get all like very uh, antsy and upset is uh, because you're carrying around that extra battery, it has pretty atrocious fuel economy, right? You're carrying around a motor and an engine. So if you never plug it in, uh, you're looking at like high teens for the fuel economy. It's only when you drive it on electric mode and plug it in at night and then drive it, you know, using the electric motor, that's when you get the, the kind of the, the fuel savings and, and the, you know, saving the earth kind of thing. If you don't ever do that, if you just drive it around and never plug it in, uh, then it's a pretty thirsty beast. I don't know why, if you've got a place to plug it in, even if you don't have you know, a dedicated 240 volt outlet. If you just have a 110 outlet, it would be pretty silly to buy one and not plug it in because it is much more affordable to run on electricity. I think a lot of people's commutes are at least 20 miles in one direction. So my, you're probably going to see a big, big fuel savings. My there. mind goes back to that Tycon road trip, Tommy, where the Tesla driver plugged in the non-Tesla charger into her Tesla, even though there was a Tesla charger right next door. So I suspect that there will be people out there who will buy this and who appreciate the savings that they get off of their uh, lease, uh, but will never actually take advantage of the battery. The issue that you were mentioning, though, is if you don't plug it in and you run it primarily as a gasoline vehicle, it's rated at 20 combined. And if you just went for a standard Rubicon with a 2-liter and an automatic, that would be rated at 22 combined. So on gasoline, the normal Rubicon does better than the 4xE because it's not lugging around a huge battery it's, that's it's, mostly... It's very heavy. Well, it's, yeah, yeah, and enormously heavy, yeah. So you're not lugging around that big, uh, basically that, empty battery. And this comes into play when we took it up the mountain, and now we're going to spill the beans. So, Tommy, how many miles of pure electric range did we get? 
Drum roll, please. We ran it twice. Nathan did it once and we did it once. We did 3.4 miles and Nathan did 3.1 miles. And that uh, has all sorts of implications for all of you guys, you guys and gals who have reservations on a Rivian or a Lightning or a Cybertruck and you want to take them off road uh, because you can uh, do the math, right? So 17 kilowatt hour battery, three miles of range. Let's multiply that by five. Let's say you've got a 100 kilowatt hour battery. You're looking at realistically having 15 to 20 miles of range off road. And the reason for that, I think, is relatively straightforward. First, we were going straight up a mountain, right? So the thing is heavy and you're going up a mountain with big chunky tires with loose grip and low range and so of course you're going to be using a lot of energy it's just that's what it takes to drive a heavy vehicle up the side of a mountain uh, but the implications mean that you know if you're thinking about going seriously off-roading in let's say a Cybertruck or Rivian your range is going to be maybe 20 miles and then after that Unlike the Jeep, you will not have an electric, you will not have a gasoline-powered engine uh, to get you down the mountain or get you home. And those chargers that they're building out, you know, Jeep's building them out, uh, and so is Rivian, right? The trail chargers, you know I'm talking about, the, yes. the ones with the solar panels, those are level two, so barely. I don't want to make it sound like it's going to be impossible to that because this was an extreme situation where we were going straight up a literal side of a mountain that just happened to be like six miles long. There were no downhills. There were no flat sections, really. It was basically straight up. And keep in mind, I think the gasoline vehicles, I wasn't paying attention to the fuel economy, but those were probably in the low single digits as well. I think if we were averaging more than four or five in the gasoline vehicles on that stretch, we'd be lucky. The difference is, though, of course, that you can refill a gasoline vehicle from a jerry can and keep going where you can't necessarily do the same thing with an electric car. So I've been talking to a lot of other kind of automotive journalists because I was, you know, I did a lot of programs recently, which we'll talk about later. But uh, I was kind of running the, this number by them and, you know, telling them, well, you can't plug the thing into a tree. Uh, and that level two charger isn't going to get you much, right? That's going to get you 10 miles in an hour of charging. Uh, and then, you know, they brought up your point, which is, you know, you guys are going up a mountain and it's extreme. But I, I thought to myself, let's talk about the other kind of off-roading that people do. So let's talk about sand. Sand can potentially actually be even more energy intensive, right? The, the, the sand rails are basically uh, very big V8s on a very light chassis. Right, that, that skim above the sand using tons of horsepower. So, you know, yeah, maybe going up a mountain is energy intensive, but I don't think being in sand is any less energy intensive. And let's go to the other side of the country, right? Let's go to like where you do mudding, right? Uh, and mud, same thing, right? Those are, these are giant tires that you're running uh, that, you know, you need to spin very quickly. Uh, which also takes intense amounts of energy to get through a bog. So, you know, maybe if you're putting down a dirt road or going down a beautiful trail where you're not doing any elevation gain, then you're not going to be using, obviously, as much power. But in the sand, in the mud, and rock crawling, you're going to be using tons of power. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's going to be fun to test because I know Emmy Hall, our buddy Emmy Hall, was that able to do... Uh, Rebel Rally in the Rivian. Right? Yes. She was able to do that. That That's, was pretty cool. That, you know, the journalist brought that up too. And you know how she was able to do that. Well, they had a truck to charge it up at no, night. No, no, no. Yeah, they did. They had a truck full of batteries. No, no, no. They had, they had more than that. They had a semi truck with a trailer attached to it with diesel generators producing huge amounts of power to, to charge up those Rivians. I've heard that that truck had like a thousand kilowatt hours worth of electricity in the back of it. From a diesel generator. It was, yeah. It, but it, 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 was, had, it had solar panels, so it would deploy. I, I, I looked at this. It had solar panels, so it deployed the solar panels, but most of the power came from the diesel generators. Right, but it still can be done. I mean, I think she proved that you are able to do longer distances off-road in electric vehicles. It just is going to be a little bit trickier maybe in some instances. And I also think that if we had just done a normal trail where we weren't going straight up a mountain, can I, can we I, would have seen some better efficiency numbers. I, I think, in fact, it proved what my point, and I'll tell you why. Do you remember Lordstown did uh, the Baja 1000? Yes. How far did they get before they ran out of juice? Well, so they did 47 miles. Exactly. Um, Before they ran out of power. I don't think they ran out of electricity. Yes, yeah. They realized that the range projections were off. 
based on their what they what they had considered. They were higher than they thought. Yeah, their consumption numbers were were higher. Yeah, but they were also in a speed race too. They weren't just casual crawling down down a trail. I mean, I think there's potential here that I really do think. There's so they a got lot of 47 potential. miles in a pure race truck on, and Emmy got like 50 miles of charge. I don't know how far she went on a charge. If you, if you read her stories, it was like 50. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, on a, and I don't know what would that Rivian have it 200 kilowatt hour battery or was it 100 kilowatt hour battery? Do you I remember? don't know what the Rivian has. I don't know if it's I know the head. Lightning can you can get 200 right in the new Ford Lightning. Ford won't tell us. They won't tell us really. No, Ford will not tell us what the battery capacity is. They how, haven't told anybody. How about the Cybertruck? Is that a no? Nope, they won't tell us either. Anyway, as far I, as I, I know, they won't I, tell m- us. My my gut tells me the dirty secret of uh, all of these companies is that you can't go very far in pure electric mode unless you're kind of, you know, going down an easy trail. I think if you're trying to go quickly or if you're trying to mud bog or if you're trying to sand or if you're trying to rock crawl, you're not going to get, you're going to get not, not, you know, let's say with towing, you get a third of the range, right? We found that out with the Model X. So if the range is 300 on the Model X, towing a 3,500-pound trailer, we got about 100 miles of range. So I think, though, Dad, the, the other interesting point you could make here, though, is, so, for example, there's a DC fast charger in downtown Moab, Utah, Yes, and, when and there's a supercharger too. Yeah, there's both. Yeah. And when you are in Moab, right, you don't, for the most part, for a lot of the trails, you're not actually going that far. Uh, for example, we did a full day out on the Moab Room Trail, and if we had driven 25 miles, maybe even 18 miles in eight hours, that was a that was a full day because it's it's just you drive out of town, you go do this really hard, nasty trail for six, seven hours, come back down. You go so slowly because you're moving over giant rocks, rock crawling, that you don't actually go that far. And then you could just pop on down to the fast charger and head back out the next day. You know what would be a good test, um, which is probably the ultimate, you know, iconic trail? If you could actually do the entire Rubicon on one charge, that would be a good test. I'm Rubicon pretty trail. sure you could because it's only 25 miles, I think. I it's not that far. And that's kind of, it's flat for the most part. There's a couple, there's Cadillac Hill. Uh, it's kind of rock crawly, right? You spend a lot of time just kind of rock crawly. The whole thing is you're on skid plates for nine hours a day. There's it's big boulders. Very rock crawly, yeah. So I'd be curious to see if you could do it. If you could do the Rubicon, then your point is valid. If you can't do the Rubicon, or if you're, you know, running the other the other problem is now you're assuming that the that the charger is in downtown Moab. What if you're doing most of the other trails around the country where the charger isn't in downtown whatever? Right, the problem with like the Rubicon is just to get to it. Remember, we, we actually, thanks to Jeep, we actually helicoptered to it. To go to the Rubicon Trail from Tahoe to get to the back end of it is probably an hour from Tahoe. Uh, to get to the front end of it is like a two hour drive. So you gotta drive there and there's no charger, at, the, at least there wasn't last time we were there, at the start of the Rubicon. Maybe they'll put one in, I don't know. I, I think, think they are putting one in. But, I think they're doing exactly that. But they're doing one of those level two chargers. All right, you could camp there though. Wait for it to charge. Overnight. Then, yeah. I just think it's an exciting world, and it's easy to come out and say, oh, it's not going to be possible. But there's going to be some interesting solutions, and I can't wait to see how that industry progresses. Yeah, there was a, a, a company in Switzerland that built a trailer where they have a pretty sizable battery in the trailer. <laughs> so I guess you could trailer a battery trailer. Did up. you hear that? That was interesting. Yeah. So they basically took an e-tron, and they towed a little camper trailer with its own battery and its own electric propulsion system. And I think it was like an 80 kilowatt hour pack. And they went, I think, 240 miles on a road trip with that thing through the Alps. Yeah. I was pretty amazed by that. Then the issue, of course, is you have to charge up the car and the trailer. But 240 miles is pretty amazing. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's an innovative and creative solution. It's farther than I think an e-tron will go by itself. Towing, for sure. Well, even empty. When e-tron's rated at, what, 220? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, how much did a trailer cost? Well, I'm sure the trailer was $100,000. Yeah. For sure. I'm sure it's ridiculous. I mean, there is that basic contradiction that, the, you know, the further you want to go, the more battery you need. But the more battery you need, the heavier the vehicle gets. And the heavier the vehicle gets, the less range it has. Yeah, it's it's, a it's diminishing returns. That's yeah. very true. But I think, Dad, that we're going to come up with some cool solutions. And the battery tech's going to improve. Right now, it may not be to the point where it's feasible. But once again, we use a tremendous amount of gas off-road. We output a tremendous amount of pollutants off-road, and we're just sitting there idling for hours on end. So it's cool to kind of be in this brave new world of electrification. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it was so much fun to be just off-roading in electric mode and hear, like, the babbling brook and the, 
the birds and the you know the wind rustling through the trees uh, and only hear the creaks and groans of the suspension versus the like you know we were pan- I don't know what is it, you know I'm still not uh, I'm still not sure about side by sides whether they're you know the the ultimate off roader or they're going to be the death of off roading it, it can go either way at this point because they are the ultimate off roader but the way they're being used is just um, in some ways a little terrifying. Uh, right, tearing up trails at speeds that, that you probably shouldn't be going up those trails, scaring wildlife and other people using the trails. But there's nothing more, in some ways, annoying than, than the sound of like a, a side by side because those engines are just so loud, right? At least like uh, on road vehicles have decibel requirements and have relatively good mufflers. Side by sides, they're just kind of four cylinders or two cylinders or even thumpers and they don't sound very melodious. And they just all you hear is you can hear them coming like a mile away. I think there are decibel requirements for side by sides as well. I bu- they must Not be. to the same point that maybe vehicles have, but uh, electric side by sides are on their way too. There's already some manufacturers who are producing them. So we're going to learn a lot more about that in the uh, coming years. Yeah, I'm just saying, you know, it was so nice. We're kind of driving along in the Jeep and I'm listening to the brook, and then all of a sudden I hear this like, where <laughs> that's kind of farty sound and it's a side by side coming up and flying up past us and then you got to get out of the way so um, yeah I, like i say i love side by sides the they make very difficult trails like we took red cone which is what a seven out of ten that's what it's rated at if, yeah. if you're doing it in a jeep by yourself and there's no traffic it's going to take you maybe three hours something like that right if you stop and look at stuff and then you have to negotiate some of the obstacles you could run that in an hour in a side by side so let's move on then and talk about what where you've been this week because you've had a cool opportunity to experience some new vehicles. Yeah, I just came back from, uh, thank you very much, Hyundai, uh, from San Francisco, actually Palo Alto. Uh, beautiful uh, city. I got to run down university all the way to Stanford. That was pretty cool. Uh, I like running on the, my favorite thing to do besides driving new vehicles is going to run in new places. So that was really cool. Uh, and it was cool on like Colorado. It was like in the mid 60s to mid 70s. That was really nice. Uh, and we got to experience uh, the new Santa Cruz, both um, uh, kind of up and down uh, those mountains and then on the highway. So uh, unfortunately, there is an embargo. So I really can't talk about you know how it drives. But you know, um, I'm not sure that's as crucial to this. The question is, you know, is it going to be something that is going to be competitive with the new compact trucks. Now, if you don't know what the Santa Cruz is, it came out, I think, 2015 at the Detroit Auto Show, uh, and it's basically a Tucson, Hyundai Tucson-based trucklet. You like to call it, you call it a trucklet, right? Yep. So it's an SUV kind of with the butt cut off, and then it's got a little, I think it's a four-foot pickup truck bed back there, four and a half feet. Yeah, exactly. Something like that. And then, of course, still four-door, so it's got a kind of a, quote, crew cab design to it, unibody. And it's supposed to slot in underneath like the mid-sized truck world, so smaller than a Tacoma and a Ranger and a Frontier. If, if we were in Australia, there'd be no doubt it's a Ute, right? Right. Yes, kind of a car-based deal. But we're not in Australia, and there's all sorts of debate on whether or not it should be called a pickup truck. And what do you think? Where do you stand on that? So um, Hyundai will be uh, happy to point out that it was designed in California, and it really feels like they had one there with uh, surfboards in the in the bed, and it really felt like it was designed as a lifestyle vehicle for Californians. So designed in California, built in Alabama, and right now only sold in North America. Uh, so it's not it's not going to be sold in Europe. It's you know the Australians want it obviously because they love their Utes, uh, but right now it's only going to be in North America. Uh, and I was thinking about this, and like the epiphany I had was, uh, you know, we just did a video uh, and got to have hands on with the Ford Maverick, right? Ford's new compact truck, and there's no question that that's a truck. Everybody's like, oh, that's a compact truck, and and I think the reason for that is because Ford builds trucks. So even though the the Ford Maverick and the um, Santa Cruz directly compete against each other. People are a little confused about the Santa Cruz because Hyundai doesn't build trucks, at least not here in America. At least not, I think maybe they have trucks in America, but not like pickup trucks. Uh, but uh, since Ford builds trucks in America, everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's definitely a truck. And people are confused whether this is. Uh, so people are kind of more comparing it to the Honda Ridgeline. Uh, but it's actually seven inches shorter than a Ridgeline, Tommy, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's substantially smaller. Yeah, I don't know why that is. So this competes directly with the Maverick. Um, 
I think they call it, what, a sport adventure vehicle or something. Yeah, so let me the tell The first you. ever sport adventure vehicle. Yeah, let me tell you kind of the, the, what you get. What, there are different configurations. Um, so you can. it starts at about, and the pricing hasn't been, I don't think, maybe it has been announced. But anyway, uh, just round about 25 to 45, give or take, depending on which one. There's their pricing. Okay, there is pricing. So twenty three nine, but you got to pay it. $1,100 destination fee. So at that point, I just add that into the price. So about 25 to 40 plus thousand. Uh, so the base model uh, comes with a four cylinder that puts out about 190 horsepower. Uh, and the, here's a cool thing. Uh, it's mated to an eight speed automatic, which is what you want if you're gonna go off road. If you want a truck that goes off road, then you're gonna want that eight speed automatic. Now uh, there's five different trim levels. Uh, so if you get to the top of the line one, which is a limited, which is the ones that we were kind of putting around in, then you get a four-cylinder turbo. I want to say it's a two-liter, 2.5, one of those two. 2.5. Uh, and that puts out basically about 100 horsepower more. So now you're at 280, but you get an eight-speed dual clutch, which we have unfortunately found for off-roading, if you care about that, to be problematic. They tend to overheat when you take them off-road. I'm just going to say this now. Whoever is buying a Santa Cruz or Maverick has probably little to no interest in actual four-wheel drive capability. I do not think that these are vehicles that will realistically ever see more than maybe a gravel road because these are vehicles that are not intended to. I mean, you can just see by the, the way the body's designed and the way that the uh, fenders intrude over the front end and the lack of underbody protection that these were never marketed or really built as off-road vehicles, maybe adventure vehicles, kind of like... Well, sports adventure vehicle yeah, to me sounds pretty uh, overlandy. That's because we deal in the world of 35-inch tall tires. If you are dealing in the world of getting you to the cool trailhead so you can take your bike out and go off-road, then I think that this is going to have the capability that you need. I really don't think that either of these vehicles are going to be used in an off-road sense. So um, there's some thoughtful features. So the base model does come with 18s, which can be off-roady, right? Because they've got enough sidewall. <laughs> let's, the let's, limit it comes on, on 20s, which probably aren't good off-road. What about this? Let's take the off-road out of the Santa Cruz for a sec. All right, let's talk about the thoughtful features. Yeah, let's talk about the thoughtful features. I think it's a good idea. Um, so uh, it, you know, inside, if you like the Tucson, then you're going to feel very comfortable with this because basically it's a Tucson. The design language... That front end fascia has got kind of that shield look, right? So it's got those little LEDs incorporated into the actual front uh, fascia of the vehicle, just like a Tucson does. Uh, the interior is very similar to a Tucson, so you've got that kind of same design language uh, where in the Limiteds we were driving, it has a massive screen. I think it's a 10.4-inch screen you know, in the, on, in the middle of the uh, instrument cluster. Then there's, of course, another one. In front of the driver, and you know how Honda does the turn signal thing, where when you hit a turn signal on the, I think it's the right side, it gives you the the little camera view to make sure you're not going to run over anybody. Well, Hyundai took it to the next level, and you go left or right, and you get a little camera view, so you know what's to the left or to the right of you, depending on which way you're turning. Uh, there is underbed seating in the back, so you can lift up the seat, and there is a, a container there where you could put stuff into if you wanted to go surfing and you want to keep something inside. Uh, and you know it was wet like a wetsuit or something it will fit under there uh, the back seat isn't too upright uh, you know there often is issue with um, pickup trucks being very upright and there's a little tiny sliding window in the back now uh, that's pretty normal um, for most now let's talk about the innovative features in the bed because really pickup trucks are about the bed so uh, Hyundai's very proud of this it's first of its kind uh, built in from the factory tanau cover yeah, I think that's it's a, roll, a... It's a roller cover. It's a really cool idea, and I got to play with it a little bit when they first revealed it. It lives at the front of the bed, and then it gives you a, kind of a spring-loaded action to pull it out and extend it over the storage area. It looks really good, and it's supposed to be more or less water-repellent. Yeah, they said it's waterproof if it's raining. If This is a direct quote. If you're, like, hosing it off at the self-wash, all bets are off. Okay. So if you're pressure washing it. And it solves that problem. Let's say you've got some friends. Let's say you got three friends, and you pick them up at the airport, and they have luggage, and it's raining, right? Where do you put the luggage? In, in a normal truck, that luggage is going to get wet. But in this, you could put it in the bed and then roll that cover and keep it dry. And just like the... Uh, Ridgeline, there's also uh, some storage space in the bed, so you, there's a little cubby hole in the bed. It's not as big as a Ridgeline. The Ridgeline is just enormous because it uh, has a space saver or it has a spare that's under the bed. When I say under the bed, I mean literally under the bed, not 
underneath the vehicle, the truck, but under the bed when you lift it up. But this has a regular spare that's underneath the truck in the chassis, mounted in the chassis. So there's a little bit of a cubby there that you can put stuff. That cubby has uh, little holes, you know, little drains. So if you want to go like tailgating, you could throw whatever libation you like. Ice. Ice in there. Um, and then they also uh, had a bunch of accessories. I think they're coming out the gate, I want to say either 40 or 80 accessories. So for instance, like uh, you, you can get the bed extender, you know, that thing that flips back and seals the um, uh, seals the tailgate so that like if you have a, something inside of it, it won't fly off. Uh, you can also uh, mount the um, uh, tailgate in two places so you can have it open or down or like down two-thirds of the way. So if you wanted to put some boards in there uh, and keep them safe, it does that. There's three lights in the bed uh, to light it up. There's also a power outlet. Uh, and then there's a, a rack system very similar to the one you'll see in a Frontier, you know, where you've got these sliding racks where you can actually put different mounting points. So if you wanted to tie something down like a bike. Uh, they say a dirt bike will fit, but probably barely. Uh, it'll have to go kind of caddy corner in the thing uh and i i would suspect it's probably a pretty small dirt bike but bicycles certainly fit uh surfboards fit uh and the payload is like just like the ridge line the payload is immense we're all scratching our heads because the payload can be anywhere from 1600 to 1800 pounds which is more than a full-size truck i think they borrowed a lot from the ridge line so the rear bed trunk like you mentioned the tailgate that swings both ways like you mentioned, is pretty much straight out of the ridge line. Very similar there. Uh, it doesn't swing both ways. I think it does. Yeah, I just saw TikTok about it. I think it, it opens like a onto the side. I think I'm pretty sure it does, Dad. I'll, I'll double check that. But I'm well, I didn't see that. But I'm, I could have not. I could have missed that. But I didn't see him showing that. There wasn't a demonstration. I, I didn't see it doing that. So I think it just opens up like a regular tailgate. But yeah, that under certainly that under bed thing they got from the ridge line. Oh. Um, and then uh, you can get it in two-wheel drive, front-wheel drive, or all-wheel drive. So depending on, you know, what you want and what you need, you can get it in both those configurations. I think it's a really smart-looking little unit. I think it's uh, very kind of futuristic in its overall design. I really enjoy the way they, they incorporated the LEDs into the front end, much like the Tucson in the grill. The, the kind of sloped, um, what's that, the C-pillar going to the bed. All just very, very they cool. Did, they, they did steal some clever features from other manufacturers. I'm not sure. I mean, everybody borrows from everybody else. But, like, if you're looking at that picture, you'll notice those, like, uh, bumper steps that are straight out of a Silverado. You see what I'm, on the corner there? You see it? Okay. Yeah, so you can get it e into the bed easier. So those are right there. Uh, you could also reach in because, it's you know, it's not that tall. You know, good God, if you're in a Raptor or a TRX, there's no way you're going to get anything from the bottom of the bed. But this is, you know, relatively easy to get to. And also the cowl height in the vehicle itself is pretty low. One of the things that Tesla does, which makes it so airy, is they keep the, the sills very low. The recent design trends have been to keep the sills, you know, the place where you rest your elbow on when the windows open really high, right? So it's uncomfortable. This is actually very comfortable because it's very low. And so it gives you kind of an airy open feel. There's also a sunroof, which also helps, makes it more airier. I think you're right. I think the tailgate is only normal. Yeah. Yeah, I was confusing that with the bed trunk, how that opens. They also had, you know, in terms of accessories, they also had like a bike rack so you can hold a bike in there. They had some cladding to make it a little bit more, you know, off-roady. The usual stuff. The stuff, certainly not like the 200 or 300 bits of stuff you can get on a full-size truck from many of the manufacturers, but they're certainly starting to, you know, because people like to accessorize their trucks, so uh, the accessories were there as well. It is quite expensive. Yeah, you're right, Dad. The bed only opens down. Yeah, it doesn't open to the side. I was wrong about that. It is quite expensive, I think. Twenty three nine ninety starting is much more expensive than the Ridgeline, which is under twenty star are much more expensive than the Maverick, the Ford. Nineteen, but, but you but the thing is we'll never see that one. But even if you look at the loaded ones, it's still more expensive than the Ford. Well the Ford let's talk about that. Let's compare and contrast, because I was just I was just in a Maverick, so I can I can give you a direct comparison between the two. Yeah, so the Maverick is a standard hybrid, unlike the Santa Cruz. So it's uh, from the very base model up a hybrid, unless you get all-wheel drive and you want a two-liter turbo, or you can you know just spec that I think in front-wheel drive too. So you can get a uh, turbocharged engine or a hybrid in the Ford. You can only get a naturally aspirated or turbocharged engine in the Hyundai. Yeah, um, and the other thing I should fail to mention, which is probably important to people, is the smaller engine tows 3,500 3, pounds, 
and the bigger engine tows 5,000. And if you're thinking about towing with it, uh, they do come factory pre-wired for a four-pin connector uh, from the smaller engine and a seven-pin connector uh, in the bigger engine, no brake controller, so you'll have to do, you do like a wireless Prodigy unit if you want a brake controller. Uh, and then the tow hitch is a factory option. Not, I think it's a factory or port. No, I think it's a factory or a dealer option if you want the tow hitch. And then the Maverick, I think, can tow up to 4,000 pounds if you get the max tow group, which is less than the Hyundai. But... If you get the tow group, if I remember correctly, the Maverick includes an integrated brake controller, which is an interesting. Yeah, it does. Trailer brake controller if you get the 4K tow package. So less towing capacity on the Ford, but you do get that brake controller. Um, yeah, no brake controller optional on the, uh, on, the Hyundai. on the Santa Cruz. Yeah. So in terms of kind of fit and feel, they do feel much different. So. Uh, obviously, uh, the Maverick is, you know, a Bronco slash Escape with a bed, right? That's the platform it's built on. Uh, and so you, you, you can um, really tell when you get in front of one and you sit behind the wheel of one that one is much more trucky and one is much more lifestyle, if you see what I mean by that. I mean, they're both lifestyle vehicles, so they're both, look, they're both going after, I think, the same customer. Uh, and we were at, talking about that, like, who's going to buy one of these, right? Uh, and the customer for these are urban people who need, uh, like, the, 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 the utility of a bed and then who like to have adventures. That's straight out of, like, the Hyundai marketing brochure. But sometimes, like we found out with Scion, you know, the people you market it to and the people who end up buying them are very different. So, like, with Scion, I remember, especially, like, the XB, it was ended up being bought by a lot of, like, empty nesters because okay. it was affordable and practical and fuel efficient and that's the kind of things that empty nesters were looking for uh, so i could see that the same thing with this vehicle i mean obviously the commercials are going to be like 20 plus tw you know, people your generation or you know in their, just in their 30s with one baby you know going out on moab adventures right taking their mountain bikes and mountain biking and taking their surfboards and surfing but whether in real life that's the people who are going to be buying these I don't know but once again let's talk about the difference between the Maverick so when you stand next to a Maverick and when you stand next to a Santa Cruz the Maverick feels more trucky right I agree because it's just designed to look more trucky uh, whereas the Santa Cruz feels more lifestyle -y, so it feels more like a Baja versus like an F-150 uh, now inside same thing when you get inside you know you're basically sitting uh, behind the wheel of like a Tucson, and if you didn't look back and you didn't see the bed, you probably wouldn't be aware that there's a bed back there. Whereas in the Maverick, uh, because it's a little bit more, you know, the glass is a little bit more upright, uh, the design language is a little bit more rugged, so like they have exposed um, screws, right? Actually nuts, you know what I mean? Uh, to show that this is a rugged vehicle. Uh, and kind of the panels are designed in such a way that they're not quite as integrated. The door handles, they kind of stick out more. Uh, and so it, it feels a lot more trucky, whereas, um, you know, the, the Santa Cruz feels a little bit more like Ridgeline-like. So, like, let's take the best of a crossover and make it into a pickup versus kind of take a crossover, make it more trucky, and turn it into a pickup. I think that the Hyundai has a much better interior. Uh, granted, of course, it is a more expensive vehicle, but the Maverick I sat in was an XLT, and the materials were pretty bargain basement versus the Hyundai, which I sat in, which felt much more... Um, in some ways, quality in terms of its materials. I mean, the one I drove was forty-one thousand dollars. So, oh, jeez, holy cow, forty-one k. That was a, that was a sticker on it. So, that, I, that, I, I, I want to. I've never sat behind the twenty-five thousand dollar one. That's that's the issue with the Hyundai, especially is when you get into that forty thousand dollar mark. I mean, at what point do you just say, uh, "I'm just going to go buy a Tacoma," right? At what point do you just say, uh, "Is this worth it? I might as well just get the bigger." Ridgeline. And I did not confirm this with the Hyundai, but my sense is, okay, they're building, they're already at the dealership, right? So they do have a head start. The Maverick's going to come out in a couple months, hopefully before the end of the year. You know, right right now, I, I, I stopped taking the word of the manufacturer as to when it's going to come out because everything's getting pushed because of the chip slash everything shortage, right, Tommy? You know, the Rivian was supposed to be out in July. Now they're saying September. Cybertruck was supposed to be bought by the end of the year. Now, realistically, it's next summer. Uh, Bronco, we don't even want to get into that that whole thing. But I, I just don't I don't take their word because I, I, I think I don't think they're lying to me. I just think that they expect everything to be the way it was, but it's not. And production delays are just inevitable. But the Santa Cruz is already out. It's a dealer's. But let me 
put that with a big caveat. I think because of the fact that there is such limited chip availability and there is such limited chip supply, if I were a manufacturer, I would only be selling and building the top end models. I'm not sure that they even are building like the, the cheaper ones yet. I think all of them have the bigger power plant and they're all like the thirty to forty thousand dollar ones. But wouldn't that kind of go against the grain, though? Because if they're the top-end trims, wouldn't they have more tech and then require more chips in the base models? Yeah, but there's also more profit. Okay. Right? They make more money, I think, on, because it doesn't cost that much more. The nice thing about the Santa Cruz, I don't know about the Maverick. I haven't been that up close with it. But the Santa Cruz has a full line of safety equipment, so like autonomous braking. Is that like, standard or is that optional, you know? I think it's standard for the most part. Most, it's, uh, it's on all trim levels. I think the Japanese and the Koreans are... Uh, providing that uh, as standard. I think even even like blind spot monitoring may be, but don't quote me on that. So it looks like, just quick, quick, quick uh, look at the trim, it looks like the SEL has the blind spot monitoring, but not the SE. Okay, so... So maybe not all standard. Not all standard, yeah. I don't know. I think from what I've seen, I much prefer the design of the Hyundai. Yeah. The I think the Ford, especially the way they've basically gone vertical with the C pillar, the what was essentially at one time called the the cab into the bed design, looks kind of dopey on the Ford. It's just it looks awkward without the division between the bed and the cab because it's unibody. And I like how they kind of blended it on the the Santa Cruz. Um, I think the Santa Cruz feels like a more premium vehicle from what I've experienced in person. Uh, I think the Ford is just incredible value though. I mean, I'm building one out, and they're all, like, mid-20s with decent technology and decent um, options. So whew, it's going to be hard to beat Ford on the pricing if they can actually roll them out in a big manner in the mid-$20,000 range for the typical trim. Yeah, the one thing I would say uh, with both of these trucks is until you've actually seen a, fo a four-foot bed uh, and you're used to full-size trucks or even mid-size trucks, you just don't understand how very small that is uh, and so i mean the vehicle's small which makes it parkable in the city right it makes it much more livable uh, but the utility is also small so if you're if you really need something with a bed i don't think this is going to be an option for people who you know who are using trucks as tools i'm not sure this would be something that like a plumber or an electrician or a general contractor would ever buy just because limited amount of space in the bed. It's something like if, you, if you're if you a gardener and you need to bring home... Like a hobby truck. It's yeah. Like ho yeah. Uh, the way I look at these, I don't look at these in the same mindset that I look at a typical pickup truck. I look at them more of like a really useful SUV. Yeah. It's kind of like an SUV that's got an infinite trunk versus, you know, an actual... Um, bed in, in, in that traditional sense. Yeah, like in a full-size truck, you'll have no problem and easily swallowing two dirt bikes, right? This one, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna struggle to swallow one dirt bike. One dirt bike. Forget about a street bike. Uh, or, for instance, if you want to throw, I don't know, three or four uh, mountain bikes into a full-size truck, no problem, right? Here, you're going to get two mountain bikes in there, and that's going to be it, right? And that's, that's going to take up the entire bed. So you, there may be some room to kind of put stuff next to them, but not a lot of room. So just, you know, be aware that, uh, that I mean, the reason the compact trucks kind of went away, I think, initially, right? Because for a while, every in the 70s and in the 80s, the Japanese came along with compact trucks, and mini trucks was another name for them, right? It was a thing. Uh, so if you're looking for, like, like you, I think that's a good way of putting it, you know, hobbyist, adventure, part-time usage of the truck. And then the thing about that tannout cover is, it also takes probably another six inches out of your trunk, right? Because it sticks that, that and, and, and I don't think it's removable. It's not like you can just pull it out and then put, you know, it, with that cover, you certainly won't fit a dirt bike in If there. I remember, I asked them and they said, you can pull it out. But it's some work. But it is some work to get it out. Yeah, yeah it bolts in. So uh, It's these, not like something you take out just to, you know, put in a big road. These are very different than the mini trucks of like the 70s and the 80s because those were those body. big beds, didn't they? Sorry to interrupt. They were big beds, but they were body on frame with solid axles for the most part, especially if you've got four-wheel drive, and they were like old-school trucky. This is going to drive like a truck, but it's going to you know, have very good capability in a lot of ways. These are a lot more like cars with a bed, so they're different kind of theory and mentality in building a vehicle. So, I'm still, I'm still hoping that a manufacturer actually builds a trucky, mini trucky truck, right? Body on frame. I don't think it's going to happen, Dad. With the new safety requirements, the new fuel economy requirements, those vehicles were very good at what they were designed for. But at the same time, by modern standards, they're very unfuel efficient, very unsafe. 
uh, much more prone yeah, to can, rollovers. You can, a, you can make a body on frame vehicle safe and you can make it fuel efficient. It's you well, the fuel efficient part's especially difficult, especially if you're looking at solid axles it's and that a, kind of gonna thing. It's going to be a little bit heavier. But you, it's also more liftable, it's also more rugged. But the EPA doesn't care about how rugged it is. They care about the corporate average fuel economy, right? What I want, you know, what I want is like, well, you know what I want? I want like what a Jimny is to a Wrangler, right? Like a little or like uh Samurai is to a Wrangler, right? It was well, just it was just a mini. It was like a shrunk down version of a Jeep, and I want a shrunk down version of a truck. And both of these aren't that. Both of these are more lifestyley. You know, think about them as crossovers that have a bed. Well, they're Subaru Bajas. They're like I think yeah, that no. was a good way of looking at it. They're like the reincarnation of the Baja, which is good, I think. Which and is, they're going to sell the bejesus out of these. Which is things. weird. Like when the Baja was for sale, nobody wanted it, and now, good God, trying to get a Baja is almost impossible. Different, it's like people came to it too late. Different era. Yeah, we have different kind of views on what we use our vehicles for now in 2021, and SUVs and especially little trucks are really, really popular. So, I think if that the Subaru Baja was around today, and it very well may make a comeback, I could absolutely see Subaru hacking the back off and out back to, to compete in this class. So, I, I think it's not out of the question that we're going to see. A New Baja to compete in the segment, but um, yeah, it's just a different funny that era. Subaru didn't do the Baja, but Hyundai did. Well, yeah, Subaru. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Subaru tried it in 2000 or whatever. Right, because they also had the Brat. So Subaru, you mm-hmm. know, Subaru has a long line of building Utes. Yep. And then uh, you know, it took Hyundai and Ford to, to kind of. Maybe they'll push them back, and maybe we'll see a Chevy, like a GM version of this. Maybe we'll see. I think I think that's a really good point. I think Chevy is sitting back and watching, and so is probably Ram. They're sitting back and watching what the sales are in both of these. I mean, Ram doesn't even have a midsize truck, let alone a compact one. The cool thing about Chevy and, and um, uh, Ram, though, is that overseas they build basically this exact thing. I mean, almost to the dot. Uh, I saw one, actually. Someone had driven one up from, I think it had Mexico plates. It was a little... Dodge truck. They, I, I talked to the Hyundai people, and they actually like benchmarked a Fiat Turo. I think is a little tiny truck. Right? Okay. Yeah. So they Very actually interesting. they said they had one, uh, and they looked at it because Europe has these size trucks. And to me, like the Turo, and if you don't know what that is, uh, you got to Google it. It's a European Fiat that's a little micro truck, a little truck. Um, you know, they, uh, they 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 benchmarked it and they looked at it. I don't think anybody's going to be like cross shopping this with Tacoma. What do you think? No, not 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 really. A Ranger, they might be cross shopping it, it with. It's called the Fullback, I think. Uh, yep. It used to be called a Turo, wasn't it? Turo. Well, I looked up Fiat Turo and it took me to Turo.com. Let's see here. I saw one at the Geneva Auto Show. Damn! Look at that, the Fiat Strada. Strada. There it is. Yeah, it looks great. I really think that's a cool little. Uh, vehicle. It says See, that looks more trucky to me. It's though. a small pickup f- truck for South America, and it looks to be the exact same kind of deal where you've got four doors with a little itty bitty bed, and then just a little tiny bit of usability back there. And then the fullback was a larger one, I think, that Fiat made. So yeah, I, they're out there, and I think Chevy has a little truck too. Yeah, they do, and I can't think of the name of it right now. South America. Let's it could see. be the Colorado as well. It could be. It could be the Colorado, but a Here smaller it is. version of it. What's I think it it's called the Montana. The Montana, that's it. I knew it was named after a state. Yep, that's it. Yep. Pretty cool. That's a two door, though. That's at a least see these pictures I'm looking at. Launch for South America. There you go. So, oh, that was 2010. That's an old article. But, anyways, they have a, a produced vehicles in this, this, this segment before, and maybe we will see a return of them to the United States. But, like I say, I think people might. Cr- so, here's what I think. I think people will definitely cross shop the Maverick with uh, the Santa Cruz just because they're the only two vehicles of their kind on sale right now, right? So people will definitely cross shop those. You'll probably also cross shop the Santa Cruz with the Ridgeline. Even though the Ridgeline is doing really well, they've like doubled their sales recently. And Tommy, when we drove that Ridgeline from California recently, uh, I got to say, if I was looking for a midsize, I was having a conversation with all the automotive journalists, and I know the Ridgeline is the least selling of the midsize truck. So, you know, when we're talking about midsize trucks, we're obviously talking about the leader, which is a Tacoma, sells 250,000 units. Uh, and then now, now recently, the Ranger and the Chevy Twins have come up next in terms of their sales numbers. So I'm talking about the Colorado and, of course, the Canyon. Um, and then you're looking at the new Frontier, which is we just talked about. So we did a whole episode on the Frontier. So if you want to find out about the Frontier, uh, go back a couple episodes and check that out. Uh, but 
in that segment, I really fell in love with the Ridgeline because the Ridgeline is basically a pilot. So it's got all the kind of the, the great driving dynamics of a car with the utility of a bed. Uh, now, if I wanted to go off-road, I wouldn't buy a Ridgeline because, well, you know, they're not grand, grand off-road as we've proved in previous videos. And I don't go into that. But, uh, you know, if you're looking for a usefulness of a truck with the driving characteristics of uh, you know, a car, the Ridgeline is certainly a, a really great choice. Um, and so I think you're right. I think people are not going to be cross shopping this with a Tacoma because I think the people who want Tacomas want trucks. Yeah, I think you said it perfectly. Yeah. So would you buy one? Um, yes, I would. Would uh, you? Would, and would you get this one or the Maverick? You've uh, been to both. I like the Santa Cruz more, but I think it's hard to beat the value of the Ford. I really do. I think if you can save a few thousand dollars and get the Ford, um, and honestly, I'd probably, I might even look into getting the Ford Hybrid. I think that's a cool option. You know, it's front wheel drive only, but I think that that will not only be the cheapest hybrid on the market, it's going to be cheaper than even like a Civic. I think it's a, I think it's a kind of an interesting little value play. So I can't wait to actually get our hands on one and drive it realistically because if I wanted a vehicle for its four-wheel drive capability and its towing capacity I wouldn't consider either of these but if I wanted a vehicle to just drive around commute to work and then carry maybe the bikes in the uh, on the weekends or maybe um, like if I'm helping mom with her little garden and I gotta you know put some soil in the back I think that the Maverick would probably fit the bill just fine even with front-wheel drive so before we get to the Kona N uh one last thing I did want to tell you, which is exciting for me, I was talking to Hyundai and I was asking him if we could actually uh, go to California, pick one up in LA, and then cross country it back to Denver just to get a sense for it, right? Driving it around the hills of California is great, but actually driving it a thousand miles gives you a much better sense. And I feel like, you know, since Honda let us drive the Ridgeline uh, back from California to Colorado, I really, really uh, learned the value of the Ridgeline and how that works. And so I'd love to actually get this on the highway and see how it works as a cross-country slash overlanding rig. And then, of course, Tommy, uh, even though chances are probably that the one we would get would be the um, top-of-the-line model, which isn't, you know, the dual clutch, we could stop in um, Moab, it's on the way, and actually do a little bit of light off-roading. So talk to me about the uh, Kona N. Oh, that's cool. Kona N is basically um, almost 300 horsepower front-wheel drive, hot hatch, uh, basically the same powertrain as the Veloster N, which is one of my favorite vehicles. Front wheel drive though? Front wheel drive only. Interesting, okay. Front wheel drive. And the coolest thing about the, the Kona N uh, is this little button that you can push and do get an overboost. So it's almost like having nitrous in your vehicle. Uh. So what you, there's a little red button on the steering wheel and you push it and you get the overboost from the turbo, taking it up from like 281, I think, to almost 290 horsepower for like 20 seconds. So the Kona N is the, just to clarify, is the hot hatch version of the very popular Kona, which is this little kind of crossover. And it continues the N lineage in the Hyundai lineup, which is kind of like the M division, but for Hyundais. So we're talking 280 horsepower out of a two liter turbocharged four cylinder and eight speed wet dual clutch transmission it's got the end corner carving differential active sports exhaust system electronically controlled suspension it's a very hot little car no pricing yet is it kona n or conan kona n kona n like veloster n not like conan n is n is the like you know they're i know hot. but look on the website it looks I, like conan i know i know it's like their amg or better yet the m division in bmw and speaking of the m division what makes the Kona and the Veloster so cool is that uh, Albert Biermann, the guy who used to do a lot of the tuning for BMW's M Division, right, was in charge of their oh, yeah. um, M Division performance tuning, has now gone over to Hyundai. And so he's helping Hyundai bring up uh, their vehicles to kind of the, I would say, you know, one of the high standards in the business, which is uh, the German uh, tuning on their suspension. Uh, and so that's why you've got the little like button on there. You also have this, Tommy. You know, you, you know how the M cars have like the M buttons. Yeah, yeah. This has N buttons. Uh, yeah, like pre-programmable. Um, yes. That's very cool. So you could you could have like one for track mode, and you can have one for like I don't know sports car mode, right? So pure track mode, uh, you can you know make it much more like the, the throttle response is much more instantaneous. Uh, steering gets much more uh, sharp, 
uh, heavy, if that's another way of putting it. Uh, and uh, once again, driving impressions are embargoed, but I did get to drive it, uh, so I, I can't really talk about what it's like to drive. Uh, but if you've driven a Veloster, and you'll probably have a sense of what this drive's like. Um, and um, yeah, it's pretty darn cool. The exhaust note is fabulous. It's got that kind of, uh, well, you drove the Veloster, and remember we, we were in um, Oregon, remember that? Yes, it's yes. Got that, it's, it's got the kind of like barky, raspy, um, you know, backfiery kind of sound when you really get on it, and that's really cool. So Hyundai says 0 to 16, 5.5 seconds. Um, that little button, I think, is the N-Grin shift mode. N-Grin, yeah, it's a weird button. It, oh, it's an overuse function that pushes 10 additional horsepower for up to 20 seconds. I just Very said interesting. that. Um, I know. I'm just. Uh, <laughs> Ingrid is I'm horrible. checking out tflcar.com, yeah. seeing what people, what what uh, Zach has written about here. Red painted calipers, alloy wheels, P0 Pirelli tires. Yep. Tailgate spoiler. Um, and then it's, and that's, you know, it's got the magic of being a hot hatch, so it also has all the utility of a hatchback. So, you know, like the GTI, the first one, you can also just drive it around town and you know take your family in it, throw your dog in the back, you know, throw a lot of stuff in the hatch part of it. So utility and sportiness. Always a great combination, uh, and usually these are also affordable. I don't think pricing has been. I don't think pricing has been. No, Actually, it hasn't been. They, they, they're only like two of these things in North America, and they brought one from Canada so that we could have it there. That's cool. Well, Dad, I think that is an hour. Wow, that went by really quick, Tommy. Uh, the one thing I do want to uh, urge you guys to check out is if you like. Um, TFL and you want to keep up to date on our podcasts because Andre of course does one uh, all of our YouTube channels uh, our news on our websites we have a new one shop stopping shopping source which is uh, uh, it's TFL dash studios dot com uh, it's a little uh, website which uh, takes all of our podcasts, videos, and news and puts them on one page. And then if you go there and you're on like a phone, a mobile device, you can say save as a web app and it'll save it as a little uh, shortcut on your phone. So you can just click on it and it'll give you all the videos that we're doing in one place along with all the podcasts and you don't have to go hunting for them. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, I've been trying to find a place to, to have a home for all of our stuff. Uh, and now there is. So it's uh, tfl dash. Studio. Somebody apparently had TFL Studios, believe it or not. Oh, bummer. So we had to do tfl-studios.com. Uh, check it out. Save it as a, a, a web app on your phone. It, it, it's not in the app store. It's not a real app. It's just a little shortcut to that page. You can, you can, but you can save it on your phone like any other icon. Uh, and then get all your TFL stuff in one place. And once again, i got to thank our Patreon. If you want to subscribe, uh, help us support this. Keep it commercial free. Go to uh, uh, patreon.com slash tflcar. Yep, for sure, guys, and we'll catch you on the next podcast. Yeah, what are we going to talk about next? Uh, I don't know. We always oh. figure it out like oh, an do. hour ahead of time. Oh, we have a quite the adventure we're doing next week. What's? Oh, yes, we do have an adventure next week. You want to tell them about the adventure? Tell them no, about the adventure. I'm not going to tell them about the adventure. Tell, you know, nope, so they'll have to the, say. I'll spill the nope, beans. Nope, I'm going to go cut the cameras. I'm going to spill the beans. I'm cutting the cameras. All right, don't well, see, see you guys next time. Ciao.